All right. So thanks again um, for talking to us for the XR Stories Project. And because we're recording, could you first share your name, where you're from, and what you do for a living? Sure. My name is Jade Malam. I'm from Western Canada. We're going to go with that because I'm about to move. And I'm an accessibility consultant, advocate, and public speaker. Uh, I'm also a Caucasian woman in my late 40s wearing a colorful headscarf and a green shirt for anybody who doesn't have a visual. Great. Thank you for describing that. Um, if you also feel comfortable sharing, could you give our listeners and viewers a little context about your disability or disabilities? Sure. So I live with multiple disabilities, but the ones that are worth mentioning impact my day-to-day -day life in more extreme ways. So to start, I have severe arthritis. I have severe arthritis in my cervical spine to be specific. It's from C7 to C1 for those who are in the know. Uh, and that means that every day of my life, I have a headache that's at least six on the pain scale. It impacts everything that I do. I always need to support my neck. Any wrong movements causes the pain to spike. And then I can't function for days afterward. It also means that I'm living with chronic pain, which is actually a number one disability in Canada. That pain also causes pain insomnia for me, which is a type of insomnia where the pain prevents me from sleeping. I function because I must, but I can feel my brain slowing down with each sleepless decade or year. <laughs> and uh, I'm neurodivergent. I have ADHD and I'm autistic. So the way that I exist in the world is not considered the norm. I'm using big air quotes there. I have a lot of comorbidities that come with it as well, which basically means a grab bag full of not so fun conditions such as dyscalculia, executive dysfunction, sensory processing disorder, et cetera. I have Tourette syndrome. At this stage of my life, it's not affecting me as much. Since COVID, I spend most of my time at home, so others don't notice my tics. I don't have to suppress them as much, so they're less bothersome. And finally, I have a blood gene mutation that caused me to have a hyperclot event in 2008. It almost killed me. Luckily, I'm still here. The clotting was from my ankle up into my abdomen. While I am lucky to be alive, it did cause extensive damage to my left leg, which found me using a wheelchair for six years, progressing to a cane for another six years. And with a lot of hard work, I can now get through my days with no mobility aids if I don't need to walk very far or very fast. Thank you so much for sharing that context, um, which is really helpful to understand a little bit of kind of what daily life is like for you. Um, and that was going to be kind of a follow-up question for me is like, what would you want us to know about your day-to-day -day life? You've, you've done a great job of kind of laying that out for us. Um, is there anything else you want us to know or thinking, think about? Uh, primarily that, you know, as an accessibility consultant, I live in a world where firsthand, first of all, I experience with my own disabilities, but secondly, working with people with disabilities, disabilities are diverse and people tend not to be aware of that. So when they're thinking about accessibility, we come down to very basic things. We're thinking about the built environment. We're thinking of ramps. We're thinking of very, very basic things. And so a big part of what I do and what I'm passionate about is breaking down those barriers and creating more understanding around diverse disabilities. So yeah, I think that that fits in pretty well when we start looking at XR, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a brain space. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, th and thanks um, for that too. I am an educator um, who teaches courses in accessibility um, and UX stuff. And we're, we're thinking about what that looks like, how it plays out. So I'm really, um, it's really great to kind of hear your perspective. So thank you for that. Very cool. um, yeah. And so you mentioned XR. Let's transition into that space. Um, and to start, can you tell me about a time you experienced XR and what that was like for you? Well, interestingly enough, I have two uh, experiences that I would highlight. So the first time was actually the very first time I experienced XR. I was working in an architecture office and they had a rig set up in the office to enable clients to walk through their site virtually. And one day while I was working, they just plopped the rig on my head 
And though it was super basic functionality in this particular instance, I was blown away. In that moment, I became so curious about VR and its potential. I'd been a gamer for years and it wasn't even on my radar. So it was, I had that moment of what is this? I knew nothing about XR before that, honestly. Then during COVID, I bought the MetaQuest 2 and a little bit anxiously put it on because I struggle with intense motion sickness when I game. So I was unsure about what to expect. And I consider this to be my first real experience with VR. And it was so powerful. I actually sat in my living room crying after the fact. Wow. Can you yeah. describe can you describe that moment just a little bit? Like what kind of led to that just sort of um overwhelm, maybe I don't know <laughs> the right word, um, but kind of like what was contributing to that? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, during COVID, uh, I'm a high risk person, as many people with disabilities are. And I had noticed that my uh inability to leave my house and and be part of society was really damaging my mental health. So I first chose to look for a meditation or calming app. And I found one. The first one I tried was like guided meditation VR. And I fell in love with it instantly. I went into like all of these different worlds. They have all of these different scenes. I was able to choose my music, my location. I turned off the guided voice and I was instantly transported into what felt very real, even though I knew it wasn't. And even though that particular app has kind of a cartoonish quality. So I literally felt all of the stress, anxiety, and overwhelming emotions from the brutal realities of being a high risk person during letter rip pandemic fall away and I could breathe. And I found myself jumping from scene to scene in awe. I wasn't even meditating at this point. I was just like jumping into a scene and experiencing it and feeling it and, and letting it wash over me. And I was doing it so quickly. I would spend maybe a minute or two in each scene, exploring, turning around, listening, and just sort of absorbing it. My wife was sitting two feet away from me and she was actually worried until she realized I was actually having an experience of complete joy. And then I went into another app that I found, I don't know if you know of it, it's called Liminal. And this one, I call it the experience app because it's exactly what you do. You go in and you choose your experience. You choose how you wanna feel, it gives you that experience and it's mind blowing. It's still my favorite app today. And I love that they're developing it more into working with mental and physical health and well being. So for me, having that, that momentary, like, I don't want to use the word escape, but it, it is, but it's not right. Like it's a little bit weird. It's kind of a middle ground, I guess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, um, I'm wondering too, based on these, couple of experiences that you've described. You said one brought you complete joy. Um, there's maybe the sense of escape in another way. Um, so seem, it seems like um, generally positive experiences um, and just kind of like this new world that maybe you didn't know you had access to, um, if I'm understanding that correctly. Oh, yeah. um, I'm wondering um, if you've reflected on those experiences since they've happened, um, that cause you to think about like, what could be possible? Like, how do we build on those things? What are some areas of growth or like gaps in this sort of technology? Yeah, you know, I think that there are a lot of gaps in the technology still. Some of them are within the applications and some of them are within the system itself. So for example, Quest itself could use a lot of work on accessibility features. Not all of their games are playable from a seated position and very few will let you lie down when you play. I need support for my neck. So usually when I'm playing, I'm sitting or lying down. And it's always disappointing when I can't do that. It's a virtual world. I should be able to adapt the game so that when I'm laying down, it orients itself to my position and adapts within the game. If I'm lying on my back, adjust that in the in-game position so my feet are where the ground would be so that I'm upright in the game. That would be epic. And most of the sitting games will allow you to walk around in the game with the controllers while your physical form is sitting still. 
but many of them don't allow you to turn around. So you can't spin around and see everything that's behind you. So sometimes I cheat and I use my computer chair so that I'm fully supported and I spin around in that. But I want to be able to do that when I'm lying down. So for me, that's a really big feature that's missing. I also found, you know, a lot of lacking within apps, right? So, you know, a lot of them don't have closed captioning and they need to. So one of the things I, I talk about liminal a lot because they've done a lot of things, right? If you choose a storytelling experience, a lot of them have closed captioning when it's telling the story, which I really like. Now, I know a lot of people don't need it, but the thing that needs to be recognized is that it's not only for the hard of hearing, which I am. It's also for people who are neurodivergent, for people who maybe don't speak English as the first language, et cetera, and so forth. It is actually, I talk about universal design a lot in my job. It is a form of universal design. We are giving people as many different forms of input as we can so that they can have the experience that is that, that works for them, right? Um, so I think that those are the big things. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of feature requests I would ask for. I don't know if uh, you're interested in hearing those now or if you want to hear those later, but certainly there are a lot that that I think could be added to to make the experience better for everyone. Yeah, and, I, and one of the follow-up questions I have is like, if you did have a magic wand, what are some things, in addition to what you've already mentioned, um, you know, what would you want to change? Um, and you can whether it's those things you just noted or alluded to on your list or more broadly around sort of the world of XR. Yeah, you know, if I had a magic wand, first thing I would do is make the units more affordable and accessible. It has been such a boost to my mental health. I can see using them in therapeutic ways, not just for those lucky few like me who can afford this big toy. I think the ultimate potential for XR is to move into that territory, total inclusivity in features and price. So more people can actually reap the physical and mental benefits. You know, I, I think we need to think about XR as more than just a game. We need to move into developing it as such. Yes, keep the games. They're fun and they're awesome. They're great for stress relief and all sorts of things. No problem. But I do want to see more health and mental health applications too. And ensuring that people with diverse disabilities can use, enjoy, and benefit from them. You know, bring on as much accessibility as we can. Dare to dream with us, right? Like, don't leave people with disabilities on the sideline. We get enough of that in the built environment. Virtual environments are virtual for a reason. It, it takes away the barriers and the limitations. And, you know, for people who have physical disabilities, it allows us to walk and run and jump and whatever for people, you know, for me, you know, I was able to start playing some more physical games for my, um, for my, my physical benefit, my health benefit. You know, I popped into a game called supernatural <laughs> that thing. If you've never seen that game, it will kick your butt in every way, shape and form. It's basically a bunch of flailing around at things that don't exist. Um, but the beauty in it is that I can do that, you know, where maybe in the real world, it would be a lot harder. You know, I'd have to find my way to an environment where I'm doing that and I'd have to have the equipment and it's, it's a lot, you know, and um, I think the whole point in my mind to VR is to remove the barriers, to give us the experiences maybe we can't have in the real world. And I think that that's where the impact comes for me. Yeah, absolutely. And so in addition to what you've shared here, um, and let's say, you know, your magic wand did work and we kind of went beyond the games, right? Which are still cool and important, um, but we thought more intentionally around health and mental health and how we sort of integrate um, those things into the space of XR, what would that mean for you? Freedom. I know it seems like kind of a strange response, but freedom. Um, there is a special space for many people with disabilities. And of course, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak to my experience. Where I've spent my whole life assimilating, whether it's my neurodivergence, whether it's my Tourette syndrome, whether, you know, whatever, right, as far as neurodivergence goes, and then my, you know, 
it takes so much energy, time, um, and thought to constantly control my brain in order to assimilate, to appear to be the norm, to be accepted. And then we talk about physical spaces, right? Physical disabilities. I wasn't disabled my whole life physically. I didn't have a wheelchair until 2008. It was a very rough awakening when I landed in that wheelchair. And very quickly, I needed to go from a space of mourning into acceptance. And not only that, but to acknowledge, well, to realize and acknowledge that wheelchair wasn't a prison. A lot of people talk about wheelchairs in very negative ways, confined to a wheelchair, restricted to a wheelchair, when the reality is that wheelchair gave me my freedom to go back in the world. Without my wheelchair, I couldn't do that. I was bedridden. They put a wheelchair under me and all of a sudden I was able to get back out in the world. So it's about thinking about things differently. I spend my life thinking about things differently and it's good, but also it's exhausting to always need to do that. So the idea of having these worlds where we can fully participate and fully enjoy is to me, honestly, the, the, the biggest goal that we could look, look toward for, for VR and, you know, XR of all types, you know, incorporating more abilities for people to be stationary, play laying down, to not have to move their body through space, to not have to hide their, their tics, their quirks, their neurodivergence. I like to call it neurospiciness and just having more descriptives in the games, for example, right? Like thinking about, one of the biggest things I've noticed on the on the um the quest is they don't have any uh notifications. This game causes nausea nausea. This game allows you to play lying down. This game has captions. There's none of that. And there's no search engines. So I could look for games I can play when I'm lying down, games that have captioning. None of those things exist in the quest but they do exist in some of the games like the app makers have created that which is good but i think we need to move beyond that almost like in the physical space where we've had to create these rules okay yes you know we're going to build this building but it needs to allow passage for everybody with disabilities of various types we need to do the same thing in this world we need to make sure it's fair and equitable and usable to everybody and to do that we have to ensure that we have these usability features, right? And they're getting there. They're offering color correction for those who need it. They offer pass-throughs, which I love. Uh, my particular headset has a pass-through and a boundary notification so I can see where I am and what's happening around me. Uh, it's a huge one. I have a dog that sometimes jumps in front of me. Neither one of us needs to get injured. It helps me find my balance when I'm getting dizzy or overwhelmed. Uh, so that's a really helpful feature. They offer height adjustments so I can calibrate my equipment so that it's more accurate, whether I'm sitting or standing or even lying down. It knows where my reach is, which is really beneficial for games where you need to move around a lot. And they finally recently introduced some audio balance to help tweak the volume, which is excellent. I have more hearing in my right ear than my left. So tweaking that sound is a nice touch. But these to me are just beginnings. This is like in the built environment, adding a ramp. It's the bare minimum. Like you know, and we need to push beyond that. So telling app makers, if you want your app to be in the system, you need to make it accessible. You need to have specific features and push at those boundaries. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've shared so much um, insightful and powerful. Thank you so much. And um, those were the major questions I had for this interview, except for one, and that is, um, if there's anything else you would like to share about your experiences that we haven't covered yet, maybe I missed, um, or anything else that didn't come up in the questions today. I think we covered the basics, you know, I think it's been a life-changing journey for me to get to experience VR and, and the disappointment I feel when something doesn't quite work because of a little, you know, functionality feature. Um, it's really frustrating, but when I get to escape into that world, um, I feel everything shift, my whole mind, my mood, everything shifts, you know, and, um, I just wish everybody could have more of that experience, no matter their disability, no matter their income, et cetera. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I am going to stop recording here. If I can find the record. <laughs>